Will America unite now that a new president has been sworn in? Probably not. Will I spend the next hour or so making dick jokes and offering poorly reasoned positions on current events? You're goddamn right I will. It's the same old shit in America, it's a fresh episode of the Savage Sack Tap, and it all starts right now. You're listening to the Savage Sack Tap. It's not a podcast, it's not a half-cast, it's just a quick shot to the balls to help you finish off the week. We're cutting through the bullshit, filling your Friday with rage-fueled logic, and cracking a few jokes along the way. So grab a bag of frozen peas. There's a savage sack tap coming your way. Smooth, lascivious, salacious, outrageous. Do do do. Greetings, Guten Tag, boys and girls. I am Mike Montone. This is the first sack tap of the Biden administration, and let me tell you something. Things are already going terribly for me. By the way, under under the Biden regime here, I went grocery shopping. And on my way into the house, one of my bags broke, leading to uh, the loss of a rather large bottle of olive oil that I had gotten at a great price, which I was already out of. So that meant I was going to have to go back out and get more olive oil if I could cook it all this weekend, uh, as well as a delicious bottle of uh, Cholula garlic, uh, garlic hot sauce. So an absolutely devastating loss for me. I will have to... Uh, I actually... I'm looking at my notes now, it says I'll have to replace both. I did replace both. They have been replaced. Um, I should not be so robotic when podcasting. That really takes you out of it, doesn't it? I'm, I'm quite sorry. Wow, what a, what a fucking jerk-off I am. Now, I did, uh, I did manage to replace both. So, that fucking... By the way, that chili Cholula sauce is amazing. If you're, uh, if you're trying to get fucking swole and you're eating a lot of chicken and rice and you're getting sick of uh, your, your flavors, your seasoning, or whatever, throw some of that uh, Cholula chili hot sauce in there. It's, uh, it's the fucking shit. But, uh, yeah, I dropped the um, fucking paper uh, grocery bag ripped. This wasn't a problem back when we had fucking plastic bags. Fucking tree huggers. Um, but the, uh, the paper bag ripped, and uh, the olive oil fell out, broke in the driveway, and it uh, it knocked the uh, Cholula out of the bag, which uh, which broke as well. And not only that, but everything else in the fucking bag wound up covered in olive oil. So there's uh, there's that. Um, yeah. So if you're keeping score right now, under the Trump administration, I was given checks for six hundred and twelve hundred dollars respectively. Under Biden, uh, I lost uh, bottles of olive oil and hot sauce. Something that never happened while Trump was in office. So yeah, like I, like I said, I am currently doing far worse under Biden than I was under Trump. I'm paying twice. I have to, I have to replace hot sauce and olive oil. I'm paying twice as much for uh, for condiments. Uh, no, I'm I'm just I'm just having a little fun with you folks. I will get to some inauguration stuff here in a few minutes because it absolutely was everything you would want from a Democrat being sworn in following a post-Trump White House. We had uh, we had pandering to the wokes, we had pearl-clutching and uh, lunacy of every kind going down on, on Twitter and in the media. Uh, there were uh, various and preposterous forms of, of virtue signaling and uh, other socio-political showmanship by, by celebrities. Uh, there were people pretending to love a uh, 22-year-old's awful poetry, People were being mean to Melania for some reason, and, and much, much more. So we will we'll get to get to all of that. Bef- but before I do, I want to address something that I noticed in an episode of The Office that was on the other night. Uh, it's one of the it's in one of the later seasons, and I know everyone's watching the fucking Office now because it's on it's on Comedy Central. Like literally, just they just run it huge blocks of The Office from like three in the afternoon to eleven o'clock at night. Uh, a few times a week, so I know you're watching the fucking office. So Oscar, of course, the gay accountant, developed a crush on uh, a gay warehouse employee. And I try to avoid making superficial judgments about people in society, but I can't imagine there's a huge gay hookup scene uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, I know the Simpsons did accuse the entire steel industry of going gay, but I, there's, I'm just not buying it. It's northeastern Pennsylvania. 
It's it's already sparsely populated to begin with, and if you've ever been to Scranton, the pro, uh, the population seems to consist mostly of uh, surly, down on their luck, blue collar types and methadone patients. So again, not exactly a a gay a hot gay hookup scene going on in Scranton, Pennsylvania, or so I would imagine. And I want you to keep that in mind as I explain why the scenario posited in the show seem to be so poorly conceived, right? The Dunder Mifflin Scranton branch is located in a very small office building with only Vance Refrigeration and a couple of other companies sharing the space. I would have Disaster Kits Unlimited and uh, some trucking company or some shit. Uh, so given the relative portion of the general male population that identifies as gay, and given the demographic makeup of the region... Uh, odds are there aren't many eligible homosexuals in town. And odds are even slimmer that uh, a fellow uh, homosexual would be working in the warehouse that your company owns. And yet despite this, Oscar spends several episodes just pining for this guy and scheming to find uh, ways to like chat him up and, and hang out with him. And at this point, I have to ask, since the warehouse guy is presumably an out-of-the-closet homosexual, why doesn't Oscar just go to the warehouse, slip him a piece of paper with his phone number on it, and say, you know, if you ever want that cock sucked or that asshole rimmed, you know where to go, bucko. Instead, he takes a few minutes, he, they have the, uh, the Christmas party, he makes a few minutes of awkward conversation, uh... He goes down to the warehouse and finds an excuse to, like, hand him his paycheck in person, like he's a fucking teenage girl dropping off a note at her crush's locker. Um, he organized an entire staff night out at a, what appears to be a Dave and Buster's type establishment with uh, drinking and arcades game and such, all so he can try to shoot his shot. And then, when the time comes, he doesn't even shoot his shot. He shoots literal shots, as in basketball. Uh, two of the few eligible homosexuals in Scranton get together twice with alcohol in the mix, once at the company Christmas party, and then again at an out-of-office drinking event, which are both, I, as far as I can tell, prime hookup opportunities, right? I'm pretty sure the Me Too movement was just born of office Christmas parties and, and like, after-work happy hours, right? Nothing says Christmas like having a few Heinekens in the break room and grabbing your secretary's ass on the way to the shitter. Am I right, boys? Goddamn right. Uh, and if you're gay, it seems like a little bit of, you know, festive cock-tugging would be apropos as well when, uh, when the Christmas season comes around. So I don't understand how the fucking writers got away with this. In real life, I feel like Oscar and the warehouse guy would have been sucking each other raw in the janitor's closet within minutes of meeting. Like, isn't that supposed to be one of the huge advantages of homosexuality? Just deviant, no-strings-attached hookups wherever you want? Um, whatchamacallit, my brother, uh, who looks like a, very much like a, a flaming twink, gets hit on by gay men all the time, and literally to the point where we've been out at bars... And they have offered to suck his cock in the bathroom. Uh, I do another podcast with my buddy who's bisexual, and he told me about how he used to use Craigslist to find casual hookups back in the day. He said he literally had a guy drive up outside of his apartment building, get out of his car, and suck his dick on the sidewalk. Right? I mean, if, if chicks were availing themselves of no-strings-attached fun around the office... Guys would not be getting an ounce of work done. It would just be a rotating door from the office to the parking lot for a quick romp in the backseat of uh, Jessica from Account Payable's Nissan. So allow me to retort. To retort! Not rotort. Retort. How the fuck is Oscar taking three episodes which unfold over a period of months, or at least weeks through the season, just to get a piece of the available gay ass working ten feet away. It's Scranton. You're gay. He's gay. Not a whole lot of other options around. It's the scarcity principle at play. Then hop on that pogo stick, baby. Fucking do it. Hmm. Anyway. 
still a good show. It's just uh, just an observation that I've made after watching it like a million fucking times. But uh, speaking of Scranton, we do have to turn now to Scranton's own, or uh, is it Delaware's own? Joe Biden. Uh, Biden was sworn in, of course, as the 46th president earlier this week with uh, Kamala Harris as uh, VP. Um, if she hasn't already, by the way, Kamala will definitely be pegging her husband before the end of the term. People were talking about the significance of the purple outfit, uh, outfit she, she wore to be uh, sworn in, and apparently purple signifies the unity between Republican red and Democrat blue, and it has some, there's some allusion there to uh, the suffragettes. Um, that, that, at least, is what the lamestream media will tell you. But here, you get the straight dope. You get the inside scoop, and what I'm telling you is that purple is the color of the strap-on that Kamala uses to plow her husband while he lays on his back and jacks away at, uh, until his fucking uh, belly button's filled with yogurt. That's what pur- that's that's what purple signifies uh, on inauguration day. It's um, you know how the QAnon people are constantly saying shit like, "Oh yeah, uh, Trump tugged his tie three times during a, a campaign speech. He was signaling to us." That's what all of the pegging couples out there said when they saw Kamala wearing that uh, wearing that color. Somewhere out in somewhere out in Red Hook, Brooklyn, there was probably a hipster couple watching the proceedings, like some chick with armpit hair and some guy with those big stupid fucking ear gauges. And after seeing Kamala in her dress, the chick got up, went to the went to the dresser drawer, got her strap on out, popped it on and uh, made her boyfriend enjoy the rest of the day's news coverage with, with rug burn on his knees and elbows. Um, so from now on, my assumption is that Kamala is signaling to people in Brooklyn, and whatever color she's wearing is the color of the dildo that Brooklynites and Upper West Siders will be penetrating their cis-hetero male boyfriends with. That's how it goes down. New regime in town, baby. USA. Uh, the pomp and circumstance surrounding the color fabric worn by our newest reptilian overlords was only the tip o the spear, however. And we've, uh, we've talked about her before on this show, but the chick who kicked for Purdue and was awarded SEC Co-Player of the Week for performing in her job in what can only be described as a semi-adequate manner, uh, she was invited to the inauguration, and I don't know if she went... But I know that they always do shit. Like, they always do shit like that to kind of appease the base. Like if Trump had won, I'm sure the the MAGA hat kid who got shamed by CNN and the and the Washington Post was his Nicholas Sandman. I'm sure they'd have him there. Uh, I get it. That's just how it works. But it's also just so fucking stupid. Like they just picked the person with the most superficial and frankly bullshit achievement and plug them into the event because the slack jawed morons watching cable news don't think critically enough to realize that be- they're just being spoon fed absolute bullshit by the uh, by the networks. Um, of course, this uh, this time around it's the the Democrats, so there's no surprise they wanted to. Uh, They wanted to celebrate the accomplishments of women, no matter how fabricated and ridiculous uh, those those accomplishments were. Uh, This poet laureate chick has been getting all sorts of coverage. And here's the thing. The poet laureate is the dumbest fucking thing in the world. Nobody needs a poet laureate, all right? We need poet laureates about as badly as we need state birds. It is just an incredibly stupid title. Like, nobody sits down and reads poetry. Nobody gives a shit about poetry. Like, it's specifically why we have rap music is because people are like, look, well, we have all this rhyming, but poetry just fucking blows. How can we spice this up a little bit? So they, they started singing it and threw a beat behind it, and, and people were like, yes, this is much more palatable. Uh, and I, I get that it's a, a woman of color speaking at the inauguration of our first woman of color vice president and, and all of that. But really, can we stop pretending that we give a shit about this? Her outfit was absolutely preposterous. Uh, She was wearing what looked like the blazer that they give you when you're inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame and some kind of big red 
fucking head thing uh, that looked like it came off of a, a Macy's Christmas tree. If you can get a, another browser window open, definitely don't don't go away from from this uh, fine production. But if you can, open it up in another browser window, and you'll see exactly what I'm what I'm talking about. Uh, just search like poet laureate inauguration and go to images and it it literally looks like she she stole michael irvin's jacket and she you know pulled a fucking ornament off of uh, the, the the macy's christmas tree but uh she did perform uh because nothing nothing appeal the the theme this year for the inauguration was unity and nothing appeals to working class americans like a harvard graduate reading poetry in front of a crowd of wealthy politicians during a broadcast carried by media conglomerates located in midtown manhattan that is how you reach out to the common man um and frankly again people are fawning over this but i thought the poem fucking sucked i like i watched it i read it i, I do a, a as you can see by the the bookshelf behind me on the the live stream here uh, I do a, a fair amount of reading, and I thought it fucking blew. But I, I pulled some selections to sort of buttress my point here. Um, here we go. What do we have? When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry. A sea we must wade. We braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow, we do it. So, like I said, this is a young woman with a, having a big moment, and not to entirely shit all over it, but this sounds like it was written by some asshole at a coffee house open mic in the East Village. Which, I, again, I realize that appeals to most of the people watching fucking CNN and MSNBC and whatever, so I kind of get why they did it, but that's the quality of writing we're talking about. And you went to fucking Harvard. If you're gonna, you're gonna go to fucking Harvard to study poetry, you better come out as the best motherfucking poet on the planet. Otherwise, you essentially wasted four years. Um, here's more. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. Give me a fucking break. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. Really? Again. Harvard, performing at the presidential inauguration, and you came up we lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. It just, it reads like a shitty line that some guy would use to try to pick up a chick at a Vietnam protest or something. We reach out our arms to one another, man. And he just, he goes in for a fucking, he's trying to snake a hug. Ugh. Just awful. What else? We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. And this part is just particularly hilarious because for the past five and a half years and continuing through the inauguration, the country has been split between two groups of people calling each other's cocksuckers on social media. And I have a feeling that the, uh, the division sowing, based on what, uh, what we saw this past month in American politics, isn't about to get much better, uh, despite what uh, Maya Angelou uh, Jr. here has to say as she continues. In this truth, in this faith, we trust. For while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. I'm sorry, I can't just not picture fucking David Allen Greer doing his Maya Angelou bit on Saturday Night Live as I read through this. And it's not a racist thing, it's just the way this fucking thing is written. 
it's it's so just kind of douchey and self-indulgent that it reminds me uh, of that. This is the era of just redemption. We feared at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour. Ooh, the heirs of such a terrifying hour. Jesus Christ. History does not have its eyes on, on her or us or anyone. History is going to look back at this period in, in America and they'll be like, yeah, so in the, uh, in the 2020s, they wouldn't let anyone go to work anymore. So to feed themselves, everyone just started taking pictures of their feet and making masturbation videos to sell on social media. That's what we're going to remember about the 2020s. That and the injustice done by the Trump administration in leaving Joe Exotic in jail. Let's continue. Here's more. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation become the future. I mean, it sounds like a fucking Pepsi commercial. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. And again, not to uh, not to beat a dead elephant, a little Democrat Republican humor for you, but this just reads like it was written by some asshole in 1997 with a little soul patch, a backwards Kangol hat, an AA in English, and a collection of Rage Against the Machine CDs. It's just fucking terrible. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid. The new dawn balloons as we free it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. Ooh, I mean, you just have to be a major league asshole to spend four years at Harvard only to come out as a fucking poet. Harvard doesn't need to be producing poet. If the Ivy League is really that special, they should be teaching people to fucking cure cancer and engineer our cities so we never have to sit in traffic again. I don't need our best universities teaching people to write fucking poetry, alright? That's not a job. It's a hobby. You do that in your free time. And besides, besides all of that, you don't need to get up and prattle about stepping out of the shade of flame and unafraid or, or bravery or any, any of that shit. You're a fucking Harvard graduate summoned by the Illuminati to read poetry to the country during the most comfortable time in human history. Like, I really do not know how all of this just didn't make everybody fucking cringe. Instead, she's just trending all over social media, be it people fucking love her. I mean, is this Saturday? It's Saturday, right? Is Saturday? Is there a Saturday Night Live tonight? I, if there is, I'm sure they'll suck her cock. Figuratively. I don't know how she identifies. Uh, what else was silly? Oh, the Foo Fighters uh, performed, of course. And the Fighters Foo, and absolute musical legends. I, every, if you don't love the, the Foo Fighters music, you're, you're an asshole with shitty taste in music. But, of course, they had to do the entertainment industry thing and dedicate their performance to unshakable teachers. Which is hilarious because there may be no group of professionals more shakable than public educators. Like, all they do is complain. These people work nine months out of the year. They regularly receive full weeks off in the middle of their nine-month work year. Uh, they get off at 3 p.m. They're just completely in charge of a bunch of kids who, who they can push around however they please. And still, these fucking clowns manage to spend all of their free time telling the rest of us how hard their lives are. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Your beach pictures posted in real time at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday in July don't exactly, they don't elicit sympathy from the working masses who are stuck at their desks because the rest of us work 12 months out of the year. I mean, it is just an absolute cabal of drama queens. There is nothing unshakable about teachers. I think what Dave Grohl should have done 
is he should have been like, hey, teachers, you guys seem incredibly fucking rattled, incredibly unhinged all of the time. I'll tell you what, I'm going to play you a nice song, calm everybody down. How would you like that? That, in my opinion, would have been an appropriate dedication to the uh, the teachers of America. You would think, based on the way that teachers behave, you would think that they were the ones working in, like, ICUs or fucking, you know, in the, uh, you know, the cramped ambulance compartment, uh, having to give fucking mouth-to-mouth to some old guy who's death-rattling from fucking COVID because we can't just let 95-year-olds die a few weeks early. We have to... We have to keep them alive to the last. That's what everyone wants. Everyone wants to. Everyone wants to live a few extra days on fucking life support. Uh, but no, yeah, that the they're the ones when they bitch about stuff. At least it's like, yeah, I get it. If if I was a nurse during this shit, I'd be fucking pissed too. But um, uh, teachers, get the fuck out of here. I say this as the son of a teacher and the very good friend of a number of teachers. I love you as people, but professionally, I do, I do have to call to question your, um, your behavior sometimes. Uh, not invited to perform at the event, but not to be outdone by the poet laureate was Caucasian hip-hop artist and all-around massive tool Macklemore. Uh, Macklemore was brave enough to drop a Trump diss track to mark the occasion, and uh, I'm not rigged up to play it into the system uh, like I used to be. I have to get a new mixing board to do shit like that. But uh, I'm a Caucasian douchebag, so I don't see why I can't rap Macklemore's lines just as well as he did. Let me, uh, let me give it a crack here. Trump's over, he lost. Social media kicked him off, he gone. Throw a party on the White House lawn. Retire the liar. Impeach that orange hoe so long. Now all you high five and... Uh, high five and MAGA white boys drinking white claws. Care about your taxes more than human rights. Sign off. I don't know. I, it can't be any worse than the way fucking Macklemore does it. Um, if they made a super woke reboot of Revenge of the Nerds, Nerds in Paradise, I think this is the song that the nerds would sing during the talent show. Because the lyrics really are dumb enough that like, I don't... Actually, I'm questioning that now. If they were doing this as a goof, like, if you did a super woke Revenge of the Nerds, they might not be able to include the song because it's so far beyond parody. MAGA white boys drinking white claws. Fucking burned him, Mac. He might have a point with that line, though. The, the only thing... That sucks worse than White Claw is Macklemore's music. Should have fucking released Thrift Shop, shut the fuck up, and disappeared. Hmm. What else? Do do do. Yes, here we go. Donald was not the only one, though, catching the ire of the New York Hollywood uh, establishment. Melania also made some headlines leading up to the uh, the inauguration. Uh, it was announced that, according to polls, she is the least popular first lady ever. Which, I'd love to see the sample that they used for that one. I'm assuming it was all ugly chicks. Like, if you saw what the broads at the Women's March looked like, it was probably a lot of them. Um, they were wiping their boyfriend's duty off of the tip of their uh, belt-fed toy. The phone rang. It was a poll taker, and they were inquiring about Melania, and uh, they were just like, yeah, she's awful, fuck that bitch, like I just fuck my, my cis male friend's boy pussy. Um, yeah. But I feel like the, uh, the poet laureate and the first lady are a lot alike. Nobody should give a shit about either of them. Like, the, the first lady always comes up with this stupid initiative, like Michelle Obama had meatless Mondays, or uh, they Nancy Reagan had say no to drugs. Uh, just it's, it's just so they can pose for a fucking photo op and make themselves look good. And it usually has, it usually has something to do with kids. Like, Melania did, it was called the Be Best, where it was uh, against bullying and shit. 
Uh, it's oh, it's, it's really just so that they can pose. The first lady can, can pose with some kids and get a, a photo op. But I was watching the crack documentary on Netflix the other night, and fucking Nancy Reagan is up there telling kids to just say no, and the crowd goes wild, and, you know, she's giving the thumbs up and clapping for herself and big fucking shit-eating grin on her face, and you know, the crack epidemic is solved, right? No, no more gang shootings or women sucking dick for crack in the South Bronx, everybody. Everything's gonna be great, and she's just basking in this adulation, and then they jump cut to a bunch of guys in Nicaragua unloading automatic weapons from a plane and filling said plane up with uh, with cocaine to go to the United States, courtesy of the Reagan administration. So it's just it's fucking hilarious to me that this completely bogus, ridiculous softball position that is the first lady manages to stoke so much passion uh, against the uh, the masses. Like, I remember people on the right just hated Michelle Obama, and I, I didn't understand that because she said, if you listen to her speak, she seems like a perfectly classy uh, and an, an intelligent woman, and, uh, you know, people on the left hate Melania, and again, I'm, I'm assuming it's because she's a hot chick and libs fucking hate uh, hot chicks, and, of course, she married the Donald, and libs hate any uh, anyone who associates freely with the uh, the Donald, um, and even though she was barely visible as a first lady, it was almost more like the the cameras pursued her than she ever pursued being out in front of them. Like it seems like she was always trying to kind of just get the fuck out of there. Uh, every once in a while, there'd be like a video of her not holding Trump's hand, and people would be like, "Oh, look, she's a prisoner. She doesn't. She won't touch him. She doesn't love him." But I still hate her. Um, and it's funny because while everyone was being a cunt to the relatively harmless Melania, Kamala Harris, who made a career prosecuting the very people most affected by the systemic racism that the Trump administration was massively blamed for, uh, Harris was receiving heaps of fucking praise as uh, as like a, a feminist pioneer of sorts. Uh, among the incredibly stupid epithets, by the way, that was spewed all over the place on Inauguration Day was, today is the last day America has not had a Madam Vice President. And I saw that all over the fucking place. Just a, a douchey, pseudo profound thing to say like oh yo you're so deep what a day for america i can guarantee you that if mccain had won there is no way the people who are like lauding kamala harris would have been this happy about fucking sarah palin and that was back like you know 15 years ago when things were mildly civil between the two sides uh, and we have women in positions of power all over the goddamn place. Like, Hillary Clinton killed half of the Middle East. Uh, Nikki Haley was the, the UN ambassador. Uh, Greta Thunberg is uh, a, a, a teenage, a female teenager, a child. And whenever she opens her mouth, uh, we have to stop and, and listen to her rant about uh, getting to, to fucking skip school uh, so she can, you know, yell at adults and, and bully her parents and sal uh, sail around the world in a, a sweet-ass boat. Uh, yeah, the, Greta Thunberg has, like, the coolest fucking life ever. Uh, the, the Kardashian and Jenner women are pretty much the, uh, the most powerful uh, people on the fucking planet. Uh, you got guys emptying their bank accounts, so so some 19-year-old chick on the other side of the country will send them a picture of uh, of their feet. And you're fucking telling me that women are oppressed in this country? The chief operating officer of Facebook is a woman. So this Vice President Kamala Harris thing is just such an arbitrary achievement to celebrate. And it was just, it's just dictated by the fuck, I mean, the networks pick the candidates and all that shit. Um, so, yeah, absolutely fucking preposterous. But, if you think that little fucking, you know, 
poorly crafted women's lib statement was the only ridiculous comment made on or around Inauguration Day, you would be sorely mistaken. Uh, I, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to just scroll through Twitter and look for people making asinine, uh, holier-than-thou, self-righteous uh, commentary uh, about uh, politics or, or society or whatever, because they always, it just, you can, you can picture them getting fucking hot under the collar with some idea rattling around in their head. They're like, oh, this is brilliant. This is going to fucking change minds, man. I'm going to fucking tell people how it is. And they put it out there and you're, you're reading it and you're just like, dude, how are you spending your fucking day? Find something else to do. Uh, so let's go through a few. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the first one is, uh, Judd Apatow retweeting a, a CNN story about the Trump administration not doing, uh, a great job of turning over, uh, the COVID operation to, to the Biden camp. A little bit bitterness, bitterness between the sides. And Judd writes, this is murder. We will need a commission to investigate this genocide of our fellow citizens. And he has been going fucking nuts on Twitter lately, which is very disheartening because I love his work. He is a, a talented, funny guy, but he has also been very open about his struggles with um, mental health uh, issues. Like if you read his book, I think it's called Sick in the Head or something like that. He really has opened up about having some some struggles with, with that kind of stuff. And this kind of social media behavior is highly indicative of that kind of thing. If I was you know, Judd in, in his squad, you know, as it were, I would suggest that he delete his Twitter and get back to writing fucking coming of age comedies for Seth Rogen, because this is, ooh, just fucking cringe, man. Uh, what do we have here? This is CNN White House correspondent John Harwood, and it's one of these ridiculous it's, you know, line by line, like it's a one, two, three, four, five, six. It's a fucking six line tweet. He, you know, hit enter between each one. He writes Trump, Arrow, Biden, and then same thing lies, truth, ignorance, knowledge, amorality, decency, cruelty, empathy, corruption, public service. Um, and first of all, this guy's supposed to be a fucking professional journalist, whatever that means in, in the year 2021. Um, but he's clearly old enough to have kind of, you know, come from the, the old school of, of news reporting. It looks like he's in his 50s or so. And he's tweeting like an angsty teenager with these arrows and multiple lines and shit. I mean, he really looks like a fucking child. And it's like, as with Judd Apatow, it's just a, a symptom of of people confusing social media with, with real life. And my mother does the same thing. Uh, she was a teacher, uh, so she worked with a lot of, of younger, you know, suburban white women. Um, so she sees the way that the younger, the younger chicks that she used to work with, she sees the way they speak on social media, and she started working the same thing into her posts. Like, she'll, uh, she'll share something, like, with my father, and she'll f refer to my father as her guy, um... And she's posting pictures of, of they got a, a new, an adorable new uh, golden retriever, uh, retriever puppy. Uh, who, and she's been referring to her, herself as that dog owner. And never in my life did my mother speak like this until COVID locked everyone inside and forced old people to spend increasing amounts of time on social media. Like the olds need to get back to living that, that Viagra commercial lifestyle where, you know, they, they sit in Adirondack chairs, sipping Zinfandel, and watching the sun set over a lake, and everybody watching knows that the guy took a boner pill a couple hours ago, and they're gonna go back to the lake house to have gross old people sex in a bedroom above the garage where the gentleman is restoring an old rowboat. Like, that's what, that's what the, the senior citizens really, really need to be, uh, be doing. They don't need to be using social media and trying to speak like, fucking what what's the generation below us 
Is it Gen Y or Z or... I don't fucking know. I suck at the alphabet. But that's what it needs to... They need to get away from that. It's getting fucking weird. Get back to living the old Viagra lifestyle, folks. Uh, what's next? Oh, this is Comedian Titus, who used to have a pretty funny show on uh, TV, I feel like, when I was in, like, maybe middle school or high school with, uh... You do it with uh, Stacy Keach. Stacy Keach has a great voice, but Titus writes, uh, I'm really emotional today. It's like I got a beloved relative back in my life. The walls are gone. And it was like a picture of the sun rising over the, the White House. And I'm reading this. I'm like, bro, you're a fucking comedian. Start acting like one. I mean, probably the best thing about Trump leaving the White House is it's going to expose how painfully unfunny uh, the these people are who have been referring to themselves as comedians for the past five years without writing a single fucking joke. Like all these people, uh, all these uh, losers did was slap the word comedian into their social media profiles and bitch about Trump on Twitter every day without giving a thought to saying anything funny. And they were just getting, you know, the, the clapter, uh, the online clapter, they call it, um, where people just approve of the fucking bland, regurgitated political statement that, that you made, but you said it in kind of a pithy way, so you, you call it a fucking joke. You're, you know, again, from fucking Brooklyn horn rim glasses, butt plug up your ass, and you made a, a, a joke about kafefi or whatever the fuck, and you're like, yeah, I'm a, a comedian. Bully for you. Ugh. Really, really looking forward to, to just seeing their careers blossom after this. What will they do? I was watching, the fucking, the late night hosts were awful too. Fucking Fallon and, and Kimmel are fucking crying. Fucking pussies. Um, anyway. Next. I will not take a deep breath until 12.01 p.m. tomorrow. This is uh, journalist Tom Nichols retweeting a video of Biden and Harris doing what was a very contrived, ridiculous memorial uh, for people who died of, of coronavirus. And not that it's ridiculous to memorialize them, but de Blasio pulled the same fucking stunt. They're just politicizing death uh, to blame Trump. And even though globally nobody has what you could call a very successful strategy uh, for COVID that uh, doesn't involve what we would call the criminal restriction of individual freedom, and even those countries ha have had resurgences, um, if they had wanted to be less transparent, they would have either done this on January 1st to kind of mark when the news reports about COVID in, uh, in China... Uh, first started or like in mid-March when we all kind of went into to lockdown but of course that's not what this is about it's about grandstanding and they lacked the tactical patience to hold off for a few weeks to make things less transparent and uh, the video of course that he retweeted was labeled this is the moment Joe Biden became president yes they, Joe Biden became president by holding a fucking hackneyed uh, celebration uh, on the backs of people who died of coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you. Gr Grandma sacrificed her life so that Joe Biden could receive applause on Twitter. Uh, here is all around lunatic Amy Siskind. She says, can't be said enough. We toppled a dictator. No, we didn't. If Trump was really a dictator, you never would have uh, lasted this long on Twitter. Uh, a dictator would not allow for four years of vocal dissent from people in the public eye. Trump zinging Jim Acosta for being a fucking tool, which I feel like even if you're a, a Democrat or on the left, or pr probably people who work at CNN, that, can everyone just agree that Jim Acosta is kind of a tool? I can't imagine he's too popular among people who know him. Like, he just seems... You see Jim Acosta and you're like, oh yeah, this guy's a fucking jerk-off, right? So Trump zinging Jim Acosta does not make Trump a dictator. It makes him either hilarious or an asshole 
depending on where you land politically. But again, I think we should all be able to agree here that Acosta comes off as a fucking chode, right? If Trump was really a dictator, then all of the people who publicly said uh, all of this shit about him for fucking years and just taunted him every fucking chance they could get, those people would all be behind bars. Next. Let the healing begin. We have needed this. This is CNN correspondent Shimon Prokupet. I can't pronounce his fucking last name. Uh, bro, you sound like a fucking pussy. Honestly, you sound like a fucking pussy. But, um, whatever. I, you know, I don't, I don't know what to fucking tell you. We're, we just live in a world of fucking, like, Adam Carolla has been predicting this forever. We lit the... The pussies have just taken over. Um, but of course we're talking about all this insanity and ridiculousness uh, in left-wing American politics. I am not a partisan. I have no real dog in this fight. Uh, I'm not into statism or idol worship uh, or any of that shit. Uh, so to balance the scales, I do think we should take a look at what the... Uh, the QAnon crowd has been up to this week because let me tell you something. There is plenty of fucking nuts to go around uh, to go around over there as well. It would be remiss of me uh, to leave it out. There is this one inner uh, woman who is interviewed who says she now believes that everything is still humming along according to plan and that Trump's election loss was all part of Q's master strategy to expose the evil doers who corrupted the vote. Things have just started, said Tiffany, who spoke on the condition that she'd only be identified by her first name for fear of harassment. They had to commit the crime to fully lock the deal. Tiffany echoed a number of ideas that QAnon channels on the encrypted chat app Telegram have floated in the last day, including that Biden's swearing-in actually had been taped 11 hours earlier, proof, somehow, of what the pro-Trump attorney Lynn Wood had told his 560,000 Telegram followers was more Biden cabal China fraud. And it just feels like we're living in this universe where different bubbles of people are just bouncing around and every once in a while one bubble collides with the other and they combine bubbles and the whole Q movement seems to be uh, a bubble of guys who like to get high and tell people about like what really went down at Roswell is colliding with guys who watch way too many Revolutionary War documentaries on the History Channel, and now their beliefs have kind of morphed into one. And it won't be long, I think, before, you know, we saw what happened at the Capitol. It won't be long before they raid the White House in search of bags of tea to throw into the Potomac River and UFO documents to post on the, uh, on the dark web. I think that's sort of the next evolution of, of QAnon in uh, a, a post-Trump presidency. Uh, what else here? We got QAnon believers are not monolithic. While some subscribe to the most extreme beliefs that Trump is waging war against a deep state cabal of powerful Satanists who drink children's blood, others adhere only to its basic tenets, which preach a deep distrust of Trump's political and media antagonists and outline how a secret worldwide system of oppression has been built to keep Trump supporters down. And you see, for me, this is the problem uh, that the mainstream press has when it comes to uh, its credibility regarding this stuff. Because as batshit as the Safeway fucking international cabal of celebrity child molesters thing sounds, the idea that Trump's political and media enemies could team up with people around the world to suppress the voices of, of his supporters is totally within the realm of possibility. Like, that's not... A fucking crazy thing to say so you need to separate the people who believe that which are many and rational people from the people who believe that uh everyone to the left of of joe biden is involved in uh some sort of uh global child molestation thing um not that there aren't a lot of 
child sex trafficking rings, but I think I think that they they transcend uh, politics. Anyway, here is uh, we have more. QAnon promoters have in the last day held up an incoherent set of new theories to explain how uh, away Trump's anticlimactic exit from Washington, that the military is in control of the country, not Biden, that Biden and Trump have switched faces, uh, face off. I took the face off. We're going to take the face off. Nicolas Cage, John Travolta, great movie, uh, that Biden's inauguration was illegitimate and that the real one for Trump would take place in March, or that Biden has been in on the QAnon plan all along. And again, like I said, this is what happens when you lock people in their homes for a year with super potent strains of uh, high THC cannabis 24-hour news coverage on multiple channels, and nothing but time to surf the internet. Because your body only produces enough cum to jerk off a few times a day, so eventually, after seeing Brooke Baldwin or Kaylee McEnany on TV, you stop running to Pornhub because your dick is chafed and your balls are drained, and you start running to 4chan and 8chan, and you light up another blunt, and you start developing theories, and you're finding confirmation for those theories, and the next thing you know, you're standing in the rotunda of the Capitol dressed like a Viking, or you're fucking, you're running out with a shit-eating grin on your face, and Nancy Pelosi's lectern in your arms. Um, that's how it goes. It's America, baby. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I love this show. I can't wait for the next episode. I think we're going to have, if we're not all dead by the end of the year, we're going to have a a hilarious year. And I realize that I probably come off as some kind of a uh, shitty Tucker Carlson wannabe at times when I do this podcast uh, because I'm constantly bitching about uh, leftist identity politics and the like. But really, I, I mostly do it because those things are hilarious to me. Like, like I said at the top, uh, there's just something I enjoy about watching a per, uh, person express righteous indignation and then you get to mock them for it. Because when someone is being righteous, it means they're really taking themselves seriously and no one is more ripe for the mocking than people who are, are taking themselves seriously in what they're doing. So I... I can't stress enough that I'm not trying to convert anyone to any kind of political position. I'm just making fun of things that are out there in the zeitgeist because it all seems so fucking ridiculous and and worthy and deserving uh, of our, our mockery. And one of those things that since we're talking about things deserving of mockery is that uh, it, it's become one of the cries of the contemporary feminist movement is that shouting fuck her right in the pussy particularly into a female reporter's microphone constitutes uh, some kind of assault which it's particularly hilarious because it's usually a local news reporter that this happens to and local news coverage is just saturated with incidents of actual assaults like there's um the, this handyman who killed all those old ladies in that NYCHA complex in Brownsville this week. Um, the hookers, they were finding dead all over uh, Lido Beach out on Long Island. Uh, the way we had that, the preppy groper, I remember. I, I was a big fan of that. Well, not a fan of him, but I loved the coverage. of They, they were looking for the preppy groper. It was this guy who used to get dressed up real nice in an overcoat, and he would go on the... Uh, the subway and grab women's asses at subway stops in lower Manhattan. Those are very real assaults. Going up the, uh, playing the old goof, uh, fucker right in the pussy, uh, into a news camera, which had had never had anything to do with sex. It was just this dirty old guy would yell something dirty into the camera whenever he came upon a live shot. Um, it was never an assault thing, but the media and feminists have started referring to it as a, as assault, uh, which is just, just fucking ridiculous. And it happened in Canada and, uh, the New York post, uh, covered it, of course, as they do all things, uh, hilarious. The New York post is my favorite source for, uh, stories about people who kill their families in suburban murder suicides 
and ridiculous things going on in the media. So here we go. Police in Canada are investigating after a TV reporter was harassed by a man who hurled a vulgar comment at her as she filmed the segment. Krista Sharp, a reporter for Canadian broadcaster CTV, was filming in the town of Kitchener in Ontario when a driver yelled, Fuck her right in the pussy out his car window before speeding away. And I will give these people the slight benefit of the doubt because it's Canada and Canadians are like the most polite people on the planet and using two bad words in one sentence probably does constitute uh, some form of criminal activity in Canada. But it's still very befuddling to me because this is the country that popularized hockey. Uh, a sport uh, in which brutes with poor dental health beat the shit out of each other with sticks and sometimes fists, all of which is permitted by the officials and cheered on uh, by fans as part of the game, and they fucking love this up there, but they're treating bad words from a distance uh, as, as some kind of uh, assault. Anyway, continuing. The journalist shared the footage on Twitter Monday, writing, This is not funny, and it's not cool. As much as I'd love to say it doesn't bother me, it does. It makes me feel like shit. Uh, first of all, shouting, Fuck her right in the pussy, into a live news camera, is indeed and objectively hilarious. I mean, it is just such a stupid, juvenile, cheese ball joke that I think we as a society have to be beyond finding any offense in it whatsoever. It is just, it's one of those things where you and a buddy are driving along and you're like, oh shit, there's a, a news camera. We gotta do, we gotta do something ridiculous. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And that's it. The first thing that comes to mind is fuck her right in the pussy. Um, they were not, as it happens, actually imploring people to come fuck this reporter in the pussy okay she wasn't getting violently assaulted on top of a pinball machine all right she had someone yell a mildly vulgar uh dated pop culture reference from a distance okay if it made you feel like shit then you are part of the problem and you are just not cut out for a job in the public eye like, them's the breaks, honey. Uh, here we go. Sharp said the harassment was especially worrisome since she often works alone, adding, This still happens to female reporters everywhere, and it needs to stop. The Waterloo Regional Police responded to Sharp's tweet saying officers would be looking into the matter. I mean, does anything sound more Canadian than the Waterloo Regional Police assigning offer officers to look into the the case of naughty language and i get being a bit rattled if you are if you're a reporter working alone and someone on the street uh shouts at you it was an early morning shift pre-dawn dark or whatever but here's the thing um first of all this appeared to be in broad daylight secondly most news scenes there's like four different reporters on the scene shooting stories. So there's kind of a strength in numbers situation. Like you're all like 50 yards away from each other doing the, the shot. If you walk through uh, Times Square uh, in the morning, uh, you'll usually get it. You'll see it with the weather vans. They're all over the, like a few blocks away from each other. So you're really, even if you're alone, you're not alone. So what we're really talking about here is this woman's fight or flight response kicking in. And it's far from an actual threat. You're just getting shocked because someone yelled something at you while you were trying to concentrate and it fucking triggered your, your adrenaline. That is the specific evolutionary reaction that you experienced. It is not a real threat. It's just a momentary uh, perception of a threat. Um, if you want to know what a real threat against a journalist looks like, there was an incident from uh, a few years back where a reporter was murdered by her ex-boyfriend during a live shot. Uh, I think it was I think it was her ex-boyfriend or, or some guy she knew who like lusted after her, and it was down in uh, Virginia. Um, that's real danger. 
Uh, I remember I got in, I, I woke up that morning and it was the first thing trending on uh, at Twitter and I was working in news at the time. So a lot of my, my news industry friends were, were sharing it. And I was like, this is what we, you trivialize shit like that or like Al Qaeda cutting a fucking journalist's head off. You trivialize that kind of stuff when, um, when you say that this is a threat against, uh, against, uh, journalists, right? That is real danger, not fuck her right in the pussy. Like, I remember when they tried to use that as, they tried to use it as proof that Jameis, uh, Winston was a rapist because he was in the cafeteria at Florida State one day and he shouted, fuck her right in the pussy. And this was at the time when fuck her right in the pussy, the meme was hot in the fucking internet streets. Like, it was everywhere. Uh, my buddy Big Joe used to do something similar when we were in college. He would uh, sit down at a random table of people in the cafeteria. He'd wait for a quiet moment, and then he would shout the word sex as loud as he could. Like, everyone, we'd quiet the cafeteria down. We'd be like, you know, give one of those. And then he would just shout the word sex at the top of his lungs. And it was one of those things that at 20 years old would have me in fucking tears laughing for several minutes. Like, the, the entire football team sitting around a couple tables. We'd take it over, and then we'd have Big Joe sit down with some fucking nerds or some theater kids, quiet the place, and then he would this just fucking... Uh, dis- he'd usually be, you know, hungover, reeking of weed and fart, uh, eating eating junk food, just a... A, a great college character, uh, a, a guy who would have been in Delta House in Animal House, one of my favorite fucking dudes that I went to school with. Uh, a fu- Him and his buddies were just uh, the funniest motherfuckers. Uh, I used to get fucked up with them all the time. And this was absolutely one of my his favorite shenanigans that, that he would uh, pull. And that's not, you're not endangering anyone by doing it. It's fucking mildly offensive at worst, but... Uh, Waterloo Regional Police Chief Brian Larkin said the footage, which has since been shared thousands of times, could be submitted as evidence, the CBC reported. This incident is unacceptable, vulgar, and offensive. No one should be subjected to hate and bullying within the workplace, Larkin tweeted. Let me tell you something. If I was a serial killer in Canada, like our old friend Luca Magnata, I would hire people to drive around yelling, fuck her right in the pussy, anytime they saw a reporter out on the street. Because cops would be so busy trying to eliminate this massive threat to Canadian women that I could just go around murdering the fuck out of people and the investigation would never get off the ground because the cops would be tied up trying to crack the case of the reporter who was briefly rattled by a bawdy joke. If you want to see what it looks like when when a reporter is really the target of harassment, then look no further than the New York Mets. Uh, near and dear to my heart, the New York Mets were bought by, and you have to always have to say, the New York Mets, uh, because that's the way sports guys like to talk, uh, were bought by a, they were bought by a billionaire who is finally, he's spending money and bringing talent out to Queens for the first time in ages, and it's fucking awesome, uh, and I love it. Not so awesome is the seduction technique employed by one of the guys that he hired uh, to track down that that Major League Baseball talent. Jared Porter's tenure as Mets general manager unceremoniously ended Tuesday morning when he was fired by the team following a report he sent lewd text messages to a female journalist in 2016. ESPN reported that Porter sent 62 unanswered text messages to the reporter who had arrived internationally to cover the MLB in 2016. Among the last of those messages included photos that displayed a bulge in Porter's crotch area and an erect naked penis. Porter initially denied to ESPN that the photos were of himself. Uh, And of course he has since been fired. Uh, the, uh, the Mets will be fine, so it's not a, a huge deal for them, uh, but this is the, uh, this is the toxic masculinity that people talk about, right? This is a reporter feeling threatened, uh, or uncomfortable, 
okay? Fuck her right in the pussy is a hilarious joke. Sending a barrage of explicit texts, including a bold shot and a dick pic, is creepy as fuck. And I get, like, if you're an 18, 25-year-old guy and you do something like that, uh, at that age, you're just a walking erection with a barely functioning brain. I will tell you that, yeah, my, my game when I was in that fucking, you know, 16 uh, to 26-year-old zone was, it's immature, it's crass, and it's terrible. Very few guys are, are good at approaching women but uh, at, at that age. Because your, your brain's just not fully developed, and you are just a ball of testosterone, and you want to stick your cock inside something wet. Uh, and you just don't, you don't go about it with any kind of uh, touch or, or delicacy. Uh, by the time, however, that you're an MLB executive, you should have the good sense and relationship experience to understand how to uh, converse with and socialize with women, right? Talking with women and treating them like people is a considerably better pickup strategy than just hurling a picture of your dick out into the ether. And I know there are guys who think that it's like a boss, alpha chimp fucking move uh, to do that, but in reality... It fucking stinks of desperation. It basically says, I can, I have no other way to get you to see my dick, so here it is. I mean, if, if a chick, if a chick wants to fuck you, she's going to find a reason to hang out with you and fuck, uh, fuck you, right? Sending a poorly framed picture of your pedestrian genitals is probably not a good plan. And I saw what this motherfucker looked like. Not good, folks. The, the absolute picture of a professionally successful booze bag uh, who hasn't taken care of his, his body or his skin and has no social skills. Like, I cannot imagine that this guy has what anybody would call a good-looking dick. And I'm not saying, by the way, that I get pussy like I'm fucking Leonardo DiCaprio. But I've certainly gotten enough to tell you that the best way to bang a chick is to learn how to have an interesting conversation, right? Quit making the entire interaction about trying to fuck them, and maybe they'll find you attractive enough to want to fuck you. I do think it would be fun, though, uh, like a fun ladies' night theme at a strip club if they did a, uh, a toxic male review. And if, you, if you're unfamiliar... Uh, a male review is, uh, it's a male strip show where a bunch of guys with giant hogs, uh, they come out and they, they dance for the ladies. And if you've ever seen a video of one, they're actually pretty hilarious because, uh, you, you actually wind up getting a lot of old ladies who attend these things, uh, like in Vegas and shit, because old people love gambling towns and gambling towns always have a lot of these strip shows. So, they, you know, they take a few, uh, you know, they take a few minutes off from the penny slots and uh, they, they go to the uh, the male review as a, a goof for an hour or two so they can have a couple uh, a couple cocktails and, and feel young again. And they wind up getting lap danced by these muscular studs. And what the guys do is, I've I seen one uh, interviewed, they, uh, they work up a rod before they hit the stage and then they take a, a little a thin rubber band and they tie off the base of their cock to keep the blood inside. So when they're out on stage, it would be impossible to, to be dancing around up there in front of a crowd to, to, to hold blood in your, in your hog uh, for an entire, you know, hour and a half, two hour show. So they do this, uh, it works kind of like a, a cock ring uh, to keep the blood inside, and it looks like they have these uh, huge, virile, meaty cocks. Um, so I was wondering about that. I was wondering how the, uh, the toxic male review would be, uh, would be, be received. Uh, let me see if I can, I gotta cleanse my throat here a little bit. Uh, cleansing your throat before the, the male review, by the way, much better than having to cleanse your throat after the male review. But let's, what would the, the male review be like? What would the strip club DJ say? Ladies, get your asses in those seats because we said so. 
This weekend, the Toxic Male Review comes to T-Bones in North Plainfield. It's three hours of the worst men you've ever met thrusting their genitals right in your face. Our star-studded lineup includes all of your least favorite, most toxic douchebags. Remember your ex-boyfriend who used to pull up outside your apartment at 3 a.m. and shine his headlights in your bedroom window? How about that co-worker who couldn't help but sneak obvious peeks down your blouse and turn the office thermostat way, way up every time you wore a sweater? The handsy personal trainer at the gym who was always offering to help with your form, and the creep from Tinder who won't take no for an answer. They're here, they're toxic, and they're more than happy to take off their pants for you and your friends at the Toxic Mail Review, where tips are demanded and no discount of any kind will be offered. That's the Toxic Mail Review. This Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 9 to midnight at T-Bones, across from the Target in North Plainfield. Be there and be disappointed. Um, poof! Wow. Sorry. Not the best read for the Toxic Mail Review. My throat is, uh, is a little bit fried. It's, uh, it's fucking cold as shit out. So I got the heat cranking in here, uh, which uh, is, is drying things out. So uh, sorry about the awful read on the toxic mail review. I hope you at least enjoyed the uh, the copy there. But uh, yeah, that's that. Look, take my advice or don't. Uh, you know, every every time some fucking guy acts like a creep with a chick, it just makes it easier uh, for well-adjusted dudes like myself uh, to get laid, and uh, I'm gonna be honest, with this, with this droopy, uh, right eye of mine, I will take all of the, uh, the help that, uh, that I can get, so I am going to, because my voice is indeed shot, I'm gonna wrap this bad boy up, I'm sure we have gone, uh, far longer than necessary, but look, watch football this weekend, uh, this is gonna be the last good weekend of football of the year, uh, because even if the Super Bowl is a good matchup and a good game, Going to a Super Bowl party will make it pretty much unwatchable because there are just going to be there be too many awful people around and they're going to be talking and there's people you know getting up and getting in your way to get food and and everything uh, and uh, they're doing boxes and all that other shit and uh, it's it's just not an enjoyable experience and uh, yes if you're wondering that is exactly how I feel uh, about my friends and family at least when it comes to football but I got. Uh, this weekend, I got, um, what do we got? Oh, who do we have? Fucking, um, we got uh, Green Bay versus uh, the Bucks, And then we got, uh, we got Mahomes. Oh, Mahomes isn't playing because he's got a fucking concussion. So I think the Bills are going to win that one. Uh, I think we're probably going to get, um... Maybe I, I think a Green Bay uh, Buffalo Super Bowl. I think Green Bay is going to win the uh, the NFC will will win the Super Bowl this year. Uh, they'll play the Bills and the uh, the Bills will will lose in the Super Bowl. That's my prediction. That's how I see it going down. Uh, who knows? You got to tune in to find out. Uh, it's the NFL playoffs. Any given Sunday, any team can win. Uh, it's the best tournament in all of sports, in my opinion. Uh, the the NCAA basketball tournament can suck a dick compared to the NFL playoffs. Uh, not that the NCAA tourney isn't, isn't fun, but uh, is, is certainly not the, uh, the NFL um, playoffs. So check that out and have a, have a good weekend. And uh, while you're doing so, make sure you're following me on, uh, on all of the social media. Facebook.com slash The Savage Crew uh, is where I uh, live stream here. I do it on YouTube as well, so please follow the, uh, the YouTube page. Trying to get my uh, subscribers up on there. And over the coming weeks, you'll sort of see me build all of this out. I just got a, a brand new webcam. I'm going to get a new uh, microphone set up here to get some better audio going into the video. And then uh, we'll start doing like a multi-stream through, uh, through a proper multi-stream platform and not use my fucking phone or anything like that. Uh, in the meantime, at Mike Montone on Twitter, uh, at Gary underscore Moiler, M-O-Y-L-E-R on Instagram. 
Uh, you can find my uh, my blog, uh, meatheadmedia.com. I, uh, I write, uh, I try to try to do about an hour article a week. Sometimes I do two. Uh, sometimes I do a couple a month, just whatever there's time for. But, uh, I, you know, I kind of write and elaborate on de- ideas that you hear in the podcast. So uh, be sure to check that out. Follow all of the shit. Send it to three of your friends. Like I always say, if, if you like this, you listen to it regularly, and you send it to three people, and one of them likes it, and he sends it to three people, we, you know, we get, uh, we get some shit. But uh, I will be probably, once I'm all set up uh, with the camera, the new mic, and, and have kind of kind of learned how to, to light and everything uh, down here, I will, uh, I will begin doing some paid advertising and uh, attempting to grow the audience uh, that way as well. So enjoy the content, tell people about it, have a good weekend eating and watching football, and don't take fucking politics too, too seriously because the people in, in power in this country don't take you fucking seriously. Uh, they're just putting on a fucking dog and pony show so they can uh, they can have your vote and your submission. That's what I says. Uh, I will catch you guys later. Have a lovely day.